Go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Emer for the Center for Disability Empowerment's Emergency Readiness Series for Individuals with Disabilities. Today's topic is the Emergency Readiness for Service Animals. My name is Marley Sade, and I am your project manager. I'm a wheelchair user with brown curly hair that is in a messy bun on the, at the top of my head. I also have brown eyes and I am wearing a gray dress. My pronouns are she and her. Today we have three presenters for you guys. We have CDE's ADA coordinator, Carla Waring, who will be talking about the laws surrounding service animals in an emergency. Good morning, Carla, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I'm a white middle-aged woman. My pronouns are she and her. I'm wearing a blue sweater. I have a hearing loss and I wear hearing aids. Um, I've been a disability rights advocate for many, many years. And prior to coming to the Center for Disability Empowerment as ADA coordinator, I worked with Northwest ADA Center, and that's out in um, Washington State. And we serve Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. We provided technical assistance, training, and consulting around the ADA um, to the four state area. And I've done many um, service animal trainings. It's a really popular training, and I'm happy to be presenting today. Well, thank you and welcome. We also have Jenny Barlos from the Greater Toledo Ability Center speaking on how service animals and are trained and prepared for emergencies. Good morning, Jenny, how are you doing today? Good morning, I'm happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit more about the service animal program the Ability Center has? Yes, okay. um, so I am a white female, a blue shirt, a shorter brown hair, and my pronouns are also she and her. I have been with assistance dogs since 2007 um, and working specifically with our consumers who get dogs. So I do a lot of their screening and help them as they're being matched with a dog and provide support with them for the lifetime of their dog. I've also done a lot of presentations here in Northwest Ohio and around Ohio and Michigan on service dogs and uh, also with businesses in how to make sure that uh, they are not violating the rights of service dog users, but also informing them of what their rights are. That's very, very, very cool. And your program serves all of Ohio, correct? Not just we, Toledo? We work in Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. So about a 250 mile radius from Sylvania here in Northwest Ohio. Very, very cool. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Of course. Um, we also have Katie Frederick from Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities presenting for us on the peer aspect of having a service animal. Good morning, Katie. How are you doing? Good morning, Marley. It's great to be here today and to, I'm looking forward to talking about um, working with a, a guide dog and I've been working with guide dogs for almost 20 years now. So happy to be here. Um, I am a Caucasian female and my pronouns are she and her. So looking forward to today's presentation. Well, oh, we're excited to have all of you with us today. So before we get started, everyone, we're gonna let Jamie Larmer, our tech person, give us a little bit of uh, some Zoom etiquette before we launch the presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, so just a couple of points here. Attendees will be muted during this webinar. You can use the chat feature in Zoom to post questions and communicate with the hosts. The webinar is being recorded and we will post an archive of the webinar on our YouTube channel. The link will be shared via email along with the slide deck and a resource page. Uh, to view the slide deck and panelists side by side, please refer to the top control panel at the bottom of your at the top of your screen. Uh, there is a drop list of settings. Click on side by side mode to see the speakers and the slides simultaneously. Excuse me, simultaneously. All right, and now Carla will start us off with the laws 
surrounding service animals. Take it away, Carla. All right. I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does everyone, can you see my screen with the picture of the signing of the ADA? Yes. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to be talking to you about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how it protects um, people with disabilities in um, all different situations, including uh, people with disabilities who have a, a, a service animal. So let's briefly go over what the ADA is and um, the different titles of the ADA. So in Jan July 26 of 1990, the ADA was signed by into law by the first President Bush. And it in this past July, it, it turned 30 years old. So it's been it's been around quite a while. It's a comprehensive civil rights act for people with disabilities, and it prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. And that also includes service animals. Okay, I'm having a okay, here we go. So these five major titles of the ADA, and I will explain these um, briefly, are we're gonna start with title one, that's employment. And the employment title covers employers with 15 or more employees, and they must provide qualified individual disabilities and equal access to benefit from the full range of employment related opportunities available to other employees who are not disabled. And this uh, applies in the application process on the job and also any kind of job related activity is like um, parties or holiday parties that an employer might have. So it uh, covers any individual with a disability uh, and, and the employer is, has to have 15 or more employees um, to be obligated under the ADA under Title I. Title II covers state and local government activities regardless of the size and it must give a person with a disability equal opportunity to benefit from all of their programs, services, and activities. And this includes emergency shelters. Many emergency shelters have state funding and so therefore it would fall under Title II of the ADA. Title III covers businesses and nonprofit service providers. So it's public accommodations are private, entities who own, lease, operate restaurants, retail stores, movie theaters, doctor's offices, homeless shelters, private transportation services like taxi companies or Uber. And um, all of these um, are covered under Title III. And depending on the funding, a shelter may fall under Title III as well as Title II. But basically any business that provides goods and services to the general public must also make those goods and services to people with disabilities, including people with disabilities and their service animal. Title IV addresses telephone and television access for people with hearing or speech disabilities. This covers closed captioning and relay services. And then finally, Title V is anything that isn't covered under the first four titles. So this concludes miscellaneous provisions such as protecting people with disabilities from retaliation when an ADA complaint is filed. Also, it states um, that if a state has enacted a stricter or more favorable law um, that protects people with disabilities, that, is, that comes first. And Ohio has two such um, laws that, that, that I wanna demonstrate or exa examples of this. So under Title I, and remember Title I is employment, and federally it's 15 or more employees. But in Ohio, we have a state law that has lowered that to four employer employees or more. So um, if you if you're an employer and you have four or more employees, and you have to you have obligations under 
um, the ADA and people with disabilities have rights under the ADA under Title I. And then um, when it comes to service dogs, um, service dogs are covered under the Title I. But what about service dogs in training? Because it, it takes some time to train a dog to provide a task for a person with disabilities. Well, the ADA federally doesn't cover service dogs in training, but however, Ohio does. So they have written into their state law that service dogs and trainees have the same protection and rights as a service dog. So those are some examples of that provision and um, just a brief overview of the five titles of the ADA. Um, each of these titles have, has a federal entity that um, provides uh, technical assistance and uh, reviews um, complaints um, if, it, if a complaint is filed. So we're gonna be focusing around Title II in this presentation. And again, that is programs, activities, and policies must be accessible to people with disabilities and their service animals. So what is the definition of the service animal under the ADA? And a service animal is defined as a dog that is individually trained to do work or to perform tasks for a person with a disability. Now, a service animal can be trained by a program like we're gonna be hearing about today, or also by a person. A person with, an uh, with a disability can train their own dog um, to be a service animal and provide a task. So it doesn't have to be trained by a, 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 a program, it can be in individually trained as well. Also, um, when it was enacted, there was a lot of confusion under the, uh, what is a service animal? And, um, and before 2008, um, people were using, were saying that their cat was a service animal, their parrot was a service animal, snakes were service animal, and, it was, and businesses and employers and every, every, people were very confused about this. And so in um, the ADA Amendment Act of 2008, um, clarified what is a service animal. And they defined it as a dog or miniature horses. So no longer can you have a cat or a parrot or a snake as a service animal. It has the, um, to be protected under the ADA, it's, an, it's a dog or a miniature horse. Now, no, and around in Ohio, um, we might not see many miniature horses as a service animal. But in the state of Alaska, where I um, consulted around, there was an, uh, a person that was using a, 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 a miniature horse um, for, uh, and it was a student, it was a student in a K through 12 program. And they did have a miniature uh, horse help them go to school and provide some tasks for them in a school environment. Now, if you wanna use a miniature horse as a service animal, you, there's some more uh, criteria that you have to follow and um, it's generally a, um, a, a reasonable modification or accommodation to have a service horse. So we're really gonna not be, not be talking about service um, horses here. We're gonna be really focusing on more of the service dog. Um, but if you do think that a service horse might be something you want to look into, um, please contact um, our office or um, the ADA Center in uh, Great Lakes Center can provide you some more information on that. So um, the, the, the other part of the ADA is it talks about a service dog is that it has to be um, individually trained and that training and that task, to, it individually trained to, to perform a, t a work or a task for a person, and it has to be directly related to the person's disability. Um, and that's, those are important, that it's gotta be related to the disability. And let's look at some examples of what service animals can do for different disabilities. So typically we think of a service animal as a guide dog. So somebody who has low vision or who is blind may use a dog to um, provide um, assistance to travel around their community, their environment. Um, it's pretty obvious what this is as, as, as it's a guide dog. 
Um, but other service animals or people with disabilities who use service animals, their disability may not be so obvious. And so um, not only is it a seeing eye dog, which we typically think of, but it can also be a per person who has a hearing impairment and they use a, a hearing or, or signal dog. And this dog is trained to uh, alert a person who has a significant hearing loss or who is deaf to maybe that the doorbell is ringing or the telephone is ringing or helping them around the community to get, be safe when they're traveling on the streets and, and, and walking. Um, another type of dog uh, that could be a service animal is a seizure, seizure response dog. So this is a dog that's individually trained to help a person uh, with a seizure disorder. And this dog may um, alert the person that they're getting, getting ready to have a seizure so that they can move to a safe place. And it can also, while they're having a seizure, guard over them or protect them during the seizure or even go in and ask for help or get help during that time. Um, another popular service animal that's coming um, that we're seeing more and more of is a, um, a psychiatric service dog. And this is uh, working with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. So a lot of veterans are um, using um, this type of service dog to help them um, move out from their home and into the community. So some examples of a, a, a psychiatric service dog for someone who has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, may be um, uh, going into, when they enter a room, that dog will go into the room prior and just sniff it out, walk around to make sure that that room is safe for that person to go into. Um, many um, veterans have experienced bombs and explosives that just come um, from nowhere, and this is it, when they come back from the from these environments, they still have those. Ex they still feel those experiences, and they need a dog that can help them move out of their homes into the community and get around safely. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these these dogs out there. Um, again, it's not obvious, so um, it can cause and for a person with a disability or a business or emergency shelter, they may, um, they, not, they may need to ask some questions. And we're going to talk about a couple of questions that a business um, can ask a person with a disability to make sure that this is an actual service animal. Um, one other animal type of animal I want to talk about is emotional support animals. And this is, a per, this is an animal that having that animal around uh, may alleviate um, symptoms related to a disability, but because of the presence that, but the mere presence of that animal being there does not make them a service animal because it doesn't perform a specific task. So it doesn't um, help them get across the street if it's a guide dog or alert them to a phone call if it's a hearing uh, dog. Um, it's, it's the presence, the presence of that animal is is helpful for them just by having that closeness, that companionship. That is not a that is not recognized as a service animal, um, and it is not covered under the ADA. However, there are some other laws that it is covered, and an, also an emotional support animal does not have to be a dog. It can be a cat. It can be a rabbit. It can be a, a any type of animal that provides uh, companionship. So the laws that um, this might um, be um, covered under an emotional support animal is the Air Carrier Access Act. And that allows service animals and emotional support animals to accompany passengers uh, with disabilities on an aircraft. Another law, the Fair Housing Act law, um, is another law that does recognize uh, emotional support animals. And, um, you, there's typically a, you have to request a re reasonable accommodation to allow an emotional support animal into your unit. Um, and if there is a no pet policy, um, the, a service animal, um, and you have a service animal, you may need to ask for a reasonable modification of policy to um, have your service animal in your unit. But um, again, there are um, a lot of information out there on these two laws. And if you want to get more information, um, the Great Lakes ADA Center is a good place to go.
for these particular laws. But we're gonna be focusing on ADA and um, what, is the, uh, what does the ADA say about identification of a service animal? So service animals are not required under the ADA to carry proof or certification or any documentation that says that they are a certified um, service animal. So you may see handlers carry papers, especially if they've worked with a program um, and been trained um, by a program to be a service animal. They may provide the, the, the person with a disability with a, with a license or a documentation that this, this animal has been trained. But that is not a requirement under the ADA. Also, you might see people with vests or badges uh, identifying the animal as a service animal. Again, this is optional. It's not required under the ADA, but it is optional for that handler. And a lot of people tend to go this direction so that they can alert the public that this is a working dog, this is not a pet, and this dog is, is there to provide um, assistance for that individual. Um, handlers can train their own service dogs. It's um, not required that it goes through a specific program. There is no license, like I said, there's no uh, registration. Um, and there are there is a large market of this. And you might even, I've heard people, uh, even though the ADA has been around for 30 years, um, people talking about, um, well, we need to have some kind of registration. I need to have some kind of certification that's a service animal. And there is not that, there is no, uh, registry for service animals. A lot of people would like to see that happen, but for right now, that's not the way the law is written. Um, there is a large market of certifi cert certificates and badges that you can uh, go online and get, but again, this is not a requirement of the ADA. Also, there is no uh, requirement for uh, breed or size of the dog. So a dog could be as little, you know, a little poodle could be a service animal all the way up to a Great Dane. Um, and there is no requirement um, on uh, the dog has to be a specific breed or size. So what are the two questions um, that a business or an emergency shelter can ask, or maybe even first responders can ask a person with a disability when they see they have a dog? Um, and that is, one, is this a service animal that is required because of a disability? And two, after that, so if the person says yes, then they can go and ask. Second question is, what work or task has this animal been trained to perform for you? Because remember, a service dog is a dog that's been trained to perform a task, a specific task for that individual. So as a person with a disability, you need to be able to say what this dog does for you. And that is okay to, to, for a person to ask you that question and it's okay for you to answer. Now they can't ask you to demonstrate that, um, but they can ask you to verbally say what the animal has been trained to perform for you. So when can an emergency shelter ask the removal of a service animal? That if an animal is out of control, jumping, barking, it substantially interferes with the reasonable enjoyment of, uh, the, of other people in the emergency shelter, they can um, ask the animal to, or maybe talk to the person with the, the service animal and see what's going on. You remember emergencies are stressful for people and for animals, okay? It's, and it, 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 so, you know, there may be um, something going on that's happening to that dog that's making them react that way. Um, but if the if service animal proposes a direct threat to the health and safety of others, it can be removed from the premises. Now, the dog can be removed, but the person with a disability can continue to access the goods and services once the dog has been removed. So um, that's a big, a big thing to remember. So if the dog has to be removed because it's out of control, um, that doesn't say that you can't still have services in that emergency shelter. Um, with that, you can come back, get your dog in a place or have somebody help you find a place for your, for your animal, but you can continue to stay at the shelter um, without your dog. So you can still have those goods and services without the animal. Sometimes an animal may be whining or barking um, 
because they're doing their job. It may be alerting someone they're getting ready to have a seizure or they're asking for help. So just because a dog barks or whines doesn't mean it's out of control. So as with a lot of ADA um, issues, it's case by case. So you have to look at the dog, you have to look at the situation, you have to look at the person um, case by case and, and in all these situations. And just because um, a shelter may have had a bad experience with a service animal or a person saying it was a service animal and a dog acted out, um, that doesn't mean that every service animal is going to act out. And so that's what's really important that the, the, the emergency shelter personnel really assess each person, each uh, team, um, the handler and their dog um, individually. So direct threats, again, are if a, if a dog continually, you know, has accidents, is not, how, not, not house trained, um, eats or drinks from the table, bites or jumps on other persons or other service animals, or wanders away from its owner. Um, and these kind of behaviors are also an indication that it's probably not a service animal. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there, they're trying to say their, their, their pets are service animals, and it really makes it difficult for people who have legitimate service animals to um, go, into, go to, to businesses and places because there's, so, there's a many people that are, um, or who are, are, are imposters. And, and, but the, the thing about a service animal, and you're here later in the presentation, um, they're, they're trained. They are, even whether they're trained by an individual or they're trained by a program, these are highly trained dogs and, and they will, they, they, they are not pets. They don't act like pets, they're working animals. And so um, it's really easy to kind of, if somebody says it's a service animal and they, they answer those two questions, you let them into the, the emergency shelter and they start acting, the, the, the dog starts acting out, you can pretty much tell that that wasn't a, a, a service animal, that it was truly a pet. Um, there's many in these emergency situations, um, many counties have programs that um, do help um, citizens with pets in emergency situations. They, um, many times they open up um, the, the um, dog shelters um, to, to people who have to evacuate and they can't take their pets with them to a shelter or um, there's just, there's a, there's a emergency planning around pets and animals and, and many um, communities have, have relationships with veterinarians and um, different community members that will, um, they can, enact and get ready if in a case of a, uh, an emergency. But um, bottom line, if you have a service animal, you, that service animal can stay with you at an emergency shelter, even if it's a shelter that doesn't accept pets. So what are your responsibilities as a handler with your service animal? And your service animal must behave in an acceptable way, must be housebroken, um, the service animal or the handler must have control of their animal, either by leash or by uh, hand signals uh, or any other effective means. Some individuals don't have um, the ability to hold a leash of a service animal, but that doesn't mean they can't have a service animal. It, it, they, but the, the, uh, the obligation is that the handler has control of that animal by other means besides a leash. If, if the uh, emergency shelter offers seating, food, or drinks, uh, the service animal is generally on the floor. It is not required to sit on the table or be fed at the table. And um, an exception to this might be a person who has diabetes and they uh, may have a, it's called a glucose alert dog. And that dog is generally carried in a chest pack, like a front pack. And it, so it can be close to the owner's face to smell their breath to alert them of any change of glucose levels. So that might be a, may see a dog that's not um, on a you know on a leash, but it's in a front pack, and that can as well be a service animal. Um, and the, but the point is that the, the dog has you know professional has professional behavior because it is a working dog and it's good grooming and has all its vaccinations and all of that is, is it, for it to be protected under the ADA. If a dog is, or a service animal is excluded, um, it, again, 
The shelter staff must still offer the goods and services to the person with a disability without the animal, animal present, and the ADA does not require a shelter to provide care or supervision of a service animal. So you want to have a plan and be prepared. Um, so be prepared to explain to first responders that you have a service animal and that you have a legal right to evacuate with your service animal. Um, do not rely on the shelter staff to provide food or supervision for your service animal. So have a uh, to-go kit, just like you would have for yourself and um, have that for your animal with food, extra water, ID tags, a vet phone, and, and a copy of the shop records, a blanket, favorite toy, or any supplies um, your service animal would need to be comfortable in an emergency environment. There are some resources I'd like to share with you uh, that go into more details uh, in a service animals in an emergency environment. It's uh, written by the National ADA National Resources. And um, they, I have a, a link to this page here, as well as Disability Rights Ohio has quite an extensive a document on service animals. And it not only goes into um, emergency situations, but all different kinds of situations, going into businesses, uh, transportation, and um, uh, housing. Also, there's a really wonderful uh, website I just found out about it's through the University of Michigan College of Law. It's called the Animal Center and they have historic and legal information on a, a variety of animal rights laws, including state by state comparison of animal rights laws. So if you know that you may be traveling to another state or you may be thinking about relocating in another state and you wanna know what those service animal laws are, this is a really good place to um, go to to get that information. This is our information here at the Center for Disability Empowerment. We're located in Columbus, Ohio. We have a phone number. We are reworking remotely, but we um, do answer our or listen to our voicemails um, many, many times a day. So if you have any questions on this, feel free to call us at this number. We also have a web address. And uh, again, um, just ask questions, reach out, be prepared. And um, we're gonna be hearing some more individuals that are gonna talk about their programs and how they work with their service animal out in the community. So I hope this information was helpful. And if you, like I said, if you have any other questions today on this webinar or in the future, please reach out to the Center for Disability Empowerment. Thank you. And next, Jenny Barlow will be talking about the service animal training. Jenny, take it away, please. Perfect. And Jamie is going to be uh, helping me with my slides here. So um, we'll start out with uh, just a little um, kind of our topic for today in this segment of the presentation is emergency planning for service dogs. And there are a variety of things that we do as a program um, to help everybody be trained to be prepared for different emergency situations. So um, Jamie, you can go on to the next slide. So the Ability Center is a, a center for independent living. Um, we serve Northwest Ohio and our specific program, again, does cover uh, Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. Um, we are, get rid of that. Okay, now I can't. There we go. Sorry about that. So we are, um, we are, the Ability Center actually started and uh, was developed in December 20th of 1920. We started as a Toledo Rotary Initiative. Um, we have demonstrated the ability to adapt and evolve 
and we paid attention to emerging trends and best practices. And that's really allowed us to continue to um, serve people with a variety of different challenges throughout that 100 years um, in many different iterations. Uh, the Ability Center Assistance Dogs Program, of which I am a part, formerly Assistance Dogs for Achieving Independence, merged with the Ability Center in 2011. So we are now considered a program of the Ability Center. And Jamie, you can go to the next slide. So it's very important, as Carla was saying, to be in prepared for any type of an emergency situation. Um, so we do a lot of training with our dogs and with our people as well. Um, so that training is critical, obviously, well before any emergency event occurs. And it's especially important for service dogs and for the people with whom they work, because there are a lot of different things that are necessary to prepare for, um, for somebody who may need power, they may need um, lots of different accommodations. So we try and do a number of things to train and prepare our dogs to go out in public, as well as the people that they're working with. And Jamie? So there are three things today that we're going to have a little discussion about that we do a lot of work for um, to make sure that everybody is prepared for any type of an emergency that comes up, whether that's a weather emergency, whether it's a fire, whether it's a, a vehicle accident. Um, so we do a lot of work with our dogs to make sure that they are prepared for any type of an emergency situation comes up. We certainly prepare the people that we work with that are receiving these dogs, but also a big part of being prepared is educating the community and our community partners uh, to make sure that, that they understand how not to violate the rights of service dog users and uh, people who have disabilities in general. Jamie? So these are some of the steps that we take in preparing all of our dogs, not only for just general public access, but also the times when an emergency may occur. And so these are the steps that, that we use with all of our dogs uh, to kind of make sure that they're ready to, to go out into public. So that includes early development training from the time that they're born and within the first couple of weeks of their birth, uh, basic socialization. So we would start when they're maybe a couple of months old, two to two and a half to three months old, and maybe we would take them out to a bank or a library, someplace that's quiet, that doesn't have a lot of distractions that are involved with it, um, just to make sure that they are going to be able to not only perform the tasks that they need help to help their person, but they're able to perform those tasks wherever they may go. So just exposing them to uh, having people walking around in a quiet way um, goes a long way toward their training. Obviously, the task training is a big part of what we do. Um, anything from picking things up that people drop to helping open doors to uh, helping with laundry or helping with clothing, um, lifting legs into bed. There are many, many tasks that that all service dogs are trained and and also uh, dogs that are performing different tasks so or different uh, types of work, guide dog work or hearing or signal work, um, that task training is really critical because as you heard from Carla, that is actually the aspect of the training that provides the person that they're working with with that protected public access rights are the tasks that the dogs are doing. Um, our dogs in our program, we because we work with Gus Harrison Correctional Facility in Adrian, Michigan, our dogs are cycled through in two different uh, times, two different age groups with those inmate handlers. So they're kind of getting that environmental training. And then toward the end of their training, they're doing a lot of uh, specialized tasks that might be very specific for the person that they're matched with and the person that they're going to, and also very specialized socialization. 
So if somebody uses public transportation, we would make sure that they're trained to uh, go on a bus and load and unload safely with their person and to be able to um, manage that situation in a way that doesn't cause anxiety for the dog so that we can, again, make sure that they're able to do the tasks that they need to do to help their person in every type of situation that they're going into. Jamie? <clears throat> so some of the specialized socialization that we do to make sure that all of our dogs are ready for emergency preparedness and all of the photos that you're seeing um, in the, this slide presentation are coming from the outings that, that our fosters are doing and that are, they're guided through with our trainers in very specific outings. So again, this photo came from a fire station outing and you'll see a lot of other photos um, throughout this presentation. So some of the specialized socialization that we're doing, they're going through security checkpoints and airline security. We have a lot of exposure to police personnel and what that looks like, uh, fire personnel and what that looks like. We do a lot of hospital visits. So they're walking around in a, a hospital setting and maybe going into some of the areas that are public that, that uh, service dogs are allowed to go into. And they're also experiencing a lot of doctor and dental visits both with our trainers and with their fosters. And again, these are outings that are mainly done with dogs that are a little bit older so that they are able to fully tolerate that and learn from these experiences. And these specialized socialization, um, you can go ahead, Jamie, that's fine. Um, they are also including sounds that they would hear, so alarms, um, sirens, things like that, um, as well as smell. So maybe some smoke, uh, maybe some uh, slight chemical uh, types of scents. Um, so all of that is kind of incorporated into that experience. In the photo here, you're seeing a dog that is in training, experiencing a fireman in full uh, fire gear so that they can hear that, uh, that breathing with the uh, the respirator, they can see um, the helmet on and all of those things. So again, seeing emergency personnel in full gear, hearing the noises that are associated with potential emergency situations. They're walking on different surfaces that can include things like um, hoses that are coiled up, um, different flooring, metal flooring in the, in the ambulance. Um, all of those different things. Again, exposure to doctors or dentists with protective gear on, uh, seeing people on gurneys, and also experiencing being in an ambulance or other emergency vehicles. Jamie? So we also want to make sure that we are doing training for the people that are getting these dogs to make sure that they are prepared with all kinds of different uh, situations that they may encounter too. Um, so on the road, when the people who are service dog users are taking their dogs out, we wanna make sure that they've got an emergency medical alert system that may allow service dog information to go along with them. So any immunization records or veterinary records may be able to be uh, stored on their emergency medical alert system. Um, they're also instructed to carry basic information about their service dog and contact information for someone who may be able to care for their dog in case they are a part of an accident where they may not be able to communicate with uh, emergency responders. Also carrying their veterinary contact and any special medical or vaccination information for their dog is helpful. So again, if they're unable to communicate with people, um, that veterinary contact is available in case their dog gets hurt. And also if they're traveling in a car, carrying in an animal first aid kit and extra food and water, just in case uh, they run into a situation where they can't get home. Jamie? 
at home. And again, you see in this picture, this is one of our dogs in training that went along on a, a dental visit. So um, they have that experience of being in that situation, have some, having someone um, working on their, their person that they're with. Um, so at home, having a, a game plan for emergency care in case of uh, the person's hospitalization. And that could be a short-term hospitalization or a longer-term hospitalization. So they have to have somebody in their support system who is able to step in, again, because it's not the hospital's re responsibility to uh, take care of a service animal. Um, and we want that service animal to have visiting rights or, or have the ability to go in and visit with their handler. Um, but if their handler is there and can't take care of their dog, then the dog should not be there and should be with somebody who, within their support system who can take care of that dog. We want to make sure that people are considering their service dog in any evacuation supplies that they're putting together. We want to make sure that the, the service dog has been trained with an automatic response in case emergency personnel are present. So if somebody falls and they have to call 911, but their dog prevents uh, or is anxious about emergency personnel entering the home, we wanna make sure that we have fully prepared the dog for that type of a situation so that they can go to a kennel, they can go to another part of the home, um, so they're kind of out of the way for any emergency uh, response that's necessary for that person. And also including notification near a visible window or the front door that a service dog is working in the home in case of fire. And the, obviously the, the fire personnel are there to get the people out first, but we certainly wanna make sure that they're aware of the fact that there is a working service dog in the home so that they can get that dog out as well. Jamie? I have a question, Jenny. Yes. This is Marley speaking. For the, for the individuals who have service animals, but maybe do not have a support network, is the Ability Center able to help them find, locate a place to house their dog? Should they be in the hospital long-term or would the Ability Center be able to house the dog themselves in that, in that time frame? That's a great question, Marley. And we have helped in that case. Um, when we are evaluating the people who are coming in, who have applied to get a service dog, one of the parts that we are looking at is what does their support system look like? So the best case scenario is obviously for them to have their own support system, but we've also experienced things which kind of goes directly back to this presentation um, where we've had a, a traveler coming through town and had an accident who and she had a service dog. And so we were able to kind of uh, step in the, as a result of the the partnerships that we've developed with some of our health care systems in our community. Um, they called us. We were able to house the dog short term until somebody could come uh, from her system, you know, from her support system at her home and come and kind of get the dog so that the dog could have more long-term care. So we are set up and we have partnerships in place um, so that we can kind of help with, with shorter term support, but maybe not necessarily with longer term support unless we uh, can kind of bring one of our volunteers or one of our fosters in. Um, and we do sometimes supply that service for, for some of our consumers who have service dogs if they need kind of a longer term uh, solution for their dog, if they have a longer term hospitalization. So um, we can kind of provide emergency care in a short term basis, or if we have it pre, um, pre arranged, we can supply longer term, but that would be kind of mainly for our own consumers. And that is a direct result of some of the, the presentations that we have done and some of the partnerships that we have put together. Um, going back to the slide with the Toledo Lucas County Health Department, um, our regional health department conference, we did a presentation at a lot of business groups around town. We've done educational presentations for, we've done a lot of work both with some of the outings that we've done, but also providing educational materials to our 
uh, local first responders, fire and police systems. Um, we've done a lot of work with ProMedica Health System here in, in Toledo and in the Northwest Ohio area. And we do a lot of educational uh, presentations for a lot of the nursing students that are here at the University of Toledo and Lourdes University. Jamie, you can go ahead. And then I also have some additional resources that kind of provide additional information for service dog users um, that want to be better prepared. Um, the Red Cross has disaster safety for people with disabilities. Uh, the ADA has an emergency preparedness guide that you can pull up, as well as um, ReadyGov individuals with disabilities provide some additional resources as well. And that's my part of the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. And Katie, take it away, please. Sure. So good morning. I just want to kind of touch on a couple of things that um, you know, my colleagues, Carla and Jenny, did a great job kind of setting the groundwork for um, the ADA and assistance animals. Um, but I am a person who is blind, and so I use a guide dog. And one of the things that is, you know, makes a guide dog a little bit different than than a service animal is, again, they all perform tasks, but my dog is trained to help get me from point A to point B in a safe, effective manner. So, you know, my dog is trained to find doors and to stop at stairs and curves and changes in elevation and, you know, to take me around obstacles when we're walking. So those are traits that he, or tasks that he can perform for me. And so, you know, dog, you know, guide dogs, cannot read um, traffic signals. So it's up to the human, the handler to direct the dog when we think it's safe to cross the street, for example. And the guide dog will stop us if if a car is coming or they think it's, it's not safe, for example. So, um, but guide dogs go through a, you know, a training program that's, you know, they're from the time they're puppies until the time that they go back to the the school for their formal training, which takes a few months, where they learn the specific um, commands to become a guide dog. And it's a very rigorous process because it's it's really the best of the best who perform this work. So, um, you know, they have to have a really good temperament, about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the dogs used are Labrador retrievers. And part of that is just because of their, their physical size, but also their temperament as well. And so, you know, labs love people and they're just a nice kind of height and size suitable for guide work. And so they are often chosen um, for that task. So guide dogs are, um, you know, trained to perform those specific tasks and in terms of emergency preparedness, I just kind of want to keep, you know, have people keep a couple of things in mind. And that kind of relates to, you know, what what is your plan? You know, what would you want to have ready in case of an emergency? So thinking about, you know, what might you put in a kit? Um, you know, certainly some, maybe some, a couple of meals of dog food and, and some water and a bowl. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about documentation, making sure that the dog's documentation is accessible to you as the person who may have a disability in whatever format you need that. So whether that's, you know, braille, large print, audio, but also making sure that it's accessible to people who might need to read it. So, you know, having a, a print paper copy or, um, you know, having it on your, you know, phone's home screen or somewhere where somebody can, can easily and readily get to that information um, is, is always a good thing. So keep making sure that that's all up to date. Um, and also just, you know, kind of reminding folks, if you, if you are working with a dog or, you know, have a dog, um, and an emergency, um, does occur, you know, it's, it helps to, you know, dogs can pick up on our emotions. So it's helpful if, if we can try to stay calm and, you know, then, then they will kind of reflect that, um, back as well. So, 
those are kind of just a few things. And, and Jenny mentioned some great resources such as the Red Cross resource for people with disabilities. Um, that's an excellent resource um, that I really encourage people to look at and check out in as it relates to um, service animals and people with disabilities. So um, I think those are the points that I wanted to make, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Does anyone have any questions at the moment for Katie, Jenny, or Carla? I had one question when we were first organizing this uh, training and it was about active shooters. Um, I was curious why service animals weren't trained to help in an emergency situation like that. And Carla, both Carla, Jenny, and Katie had some really great points about that. Um, could you guys potentially maybe elaborate on that a little bit for the participants? Sure, I mean, I guess just uh, quickly, and, and I'll just say this so that if Carla has anything or Katie has anything, mm -hmm. I mean, in that type of a situation, um, it's, it's really critical that uh, there are several steps in an active shooter situation, um, obviously trying to get out of that situation as quickly as possible, which a dog may be able to help with, um, or hiding, um, and as a kind of last resort, fighting back. So, um, you know, again, as in any emergency situation, the, the person is um, the primary uh, concern. Um, so getting people out of that situation um, and certainly taking the dogs along with you as, as necessary or as available, um, but the people are always kind of the, the primary concern <clears throat> in that situation. Um, it's really hard to train for that because there are also um, stressors. There's a very high uh, stress factor in that. So it's, it's kind of hard to replicate that in a, in a training situation from our standpoint. But you know, we, we do try and prepare them as best we can. I think the, this is Katie. I think the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, guide dogs and service dogs aren't necessarily trained to guard or protect, but at the same time, while that's not part of their training, um, it's, you know, we don't know what they would do in an emergency situation and hopefully we never have to find out, um, you know, but that is one of those things where, um, again, it's it's not part of their training. They're they're taught to you know work with their person and 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 you know obey those commands and things. But um, you know, first and foremost, they are dogs, and so um, you know, um, there's there's not really a, a as Jenny said, an effective way to to train for that. Um, and so, hopefully, you know, the dog would be able to help the person get out and get to safety. Thank you so much for answering that question for us, guys. Does anyone in the audience have any comments, questions, concerns? If not, then I guess we can all head out for lunch a little early. I would like everybody to keep in mind that we also have another presentation on Friday, and that one will be the emergency readiness transportation presentation. I also want everyone to remember that all of the free emergency supplies are on an incentive basis. So the more, the more you attend, the more free emergency readiness supplies you will receive. I would like to thank our presenters, Carla, Jenny, and Katie for their awesome insight regarding service animals in an emergency. I would love to also thank PRI Captioning for their services and our tech person, Jamie Larmer, for the assist. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy your week. Have a good day. Bye-bye.